In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It probably feels nice to have some leg room today with the college retreat being out and uh, about 100 plus people not being in this room. So enjoy the leg room while it lasts. Enjoy the extra coffee and the snacks because next week they're back. No, we love our college youth. So, so, uh, so glad that all of you are here today as we start this new series on waiting on God. Now, I think a lot of us uh, have a lot of questions about this subject. A lot of us, when we are going through hard times, we're in the difficult periods that we go through. Where are you, Lord? Where are you in the midst of my struggles? How come you're not intervening? Do you want me to keep in this waiting period? Do you want me to stay where I am? Until when? How many of us have felt this like desperate desire for God to come enter into a certain circumstance that we're in right now to deliver us? I think all of us have felt this, this feeling of waiting on God. And my hope for us over the next four weeks as we start our community groups and we start to really dive deep onto the subject is that we can really say, Lord, we trust in your timing. We trust in your timing. We may not fully understand it. We may not fully be able to grasp it, but we trust in your timing. So I want to present two little assessments for you this morning for us to really think through. So you're at a coffee shop, and the person in front of you is having an extended conversation with the barista. And you have places to go, you have people to see, and you're kind of waiting patiently. So you have three scenarios that you can sort of do. You can sit there and you could be very, very happy of the community that you live in. You could say, wow, these people really care about each other, and they have such good dialogue, and it's really beautiful. And I actually, I should invite them to my community group because I think they would be really good members of my community group. There's obviously talkative people, so, or so, also, you think of the things, option two, that you would like to say to the barista. You're jealous of the conversation. You're like, you know what? I want to have a really extended conversation with the barista as well. Or you stand there behind and you clear your throat saying, <coughs> interrupting. The point that I'm trying to make is we have struggles with waiting. We're impatient. We live in a fast-paced world. And when somebody's slowing us down, it's frustrating. It takes a little bit of, uh, of being present to really process how you feel in that moment. I'll give you another scenario. You're at a doctor's office. Infamously, doctor's offices are the worst. You sit and you could wait over an hour. So you're in this jam-packed room. You come in and you've already been waiting an hour and you see that the cue for when you're going to be seen next is still a while. What do you do? Do you say, this is a really great opportunity for me to catch up on the latest episode, latest issue of Cosmopolitan? Or do you say that this is like the really great opportunity for me to catch up on my emails? Is this like, what are you thinking in that moment? Or do you take the option of, you start to tell all the patients around you that you have this highly contagious disease and that you sh they should all clear the room and you know, they should make sure that you get treated first? Or do you take the opportunity, if you're a little bit more dramatic, and do you hyperventilate and make a big scene in order to be seen first? Anyway, I joke, but I think a lot of us would probably think about doing that. Sometimes waiting doesn't feel like a big deal and sometimes it feels like a huge deal. Sometimes when we're in the middle of waiting, we are freaking out, we're frantic, we're upset. And the point that I'm trying to make to every single one of us is waiting is not easy, it's hard, it's actually super difficult. And I think it's easy for us to joke around about like scenarios of our day-to-day -day lives, right? Like, I'm waiting at a doctor's office, I'm waiting for a cup of coffee, you know, I'm waiting for my cue in a gas line. If anyone lives in Burke, there's this one gas station that is like a little bit cheap and the queue for that line for like five cents cheaper is insane. I can't understand it. Why like the next gas station is five cents more? Why are you waiting an hour for gas? Like I don't understand it, but people sometimes are willing to wait for things, right? When they feel like they're getting a good deal. The point is, is we're not good at waiting. So I want us to be thinking about what we're waiting on today. Maybe some of us are waiting for a spouse. You're in that period where you're like, Lord, I've been single and I've been ready to mingle for a very long time. And <laughs> I've been praying, and I've been hoping, and I've been trusting, and I've been doing everything in my power, and Lord, I am eager for a spouse. Or maybe some of us are struggling with having a, children, a child and been waiting for a long period of time and doing everything in your power, going to doctors, praying, seeking God, and saying, Lord, I really want 
a baby. And maybe some of us are waiting for a home. Maybe some of us have been, you know, saving for a long period of time and you finally feel like you're going to get a good break and then all of a sudden something happens where your bank account feels like it needs to be cleared out and what you saved for can't really surmount to what you were hoping for. Maybe some of us are waiting for one of our children who has fallen away from the church to come back home to God. And we're praying and we're hoping and we're asking the Lord, please, Lord, intervene. Do something in the heart of my son or my daughter for them to come back. Some of us are waiting healing, sick, or family members that are sick. And Lord, when are you going to enter? When are you going to bring deliverance? And I think so many of us maybe are waiting and waiting and waiting. Some of us are in relationships and marriages and are waiting for our spouses to change. All of us are going through a season of waiting. And above all, all of us are waiting for the Lord's return one day. So waiting is not something that none of us are unacquainted with. All of us in some place in our life have been waiting for something. So have you been waiting or praying for something and you're waiting for it for a long time? Have you been in a hurry about something and feel God isn't? How do you handle that delay in your life? What do you do? What's your go-to? So there are three things I think that happen when we're waiting upon God. And if, obviously there's many more things that have happened, but as I've been taking confessions, I've been trying to really process what people do when they wait on the Lord. I think three things can happen. One is you can become frustrated. You can become very frustrated and you can start to think to yourself, what do I need to do to fix my situation? What do I need to do to change the narrative? Lights out. Somebody pressed on that light. There we go. God is telling me to, you know, pick up the pace and move this talk a little bit faster. Get into it, Abuna. Let's go. We can become frustrated. And you can feel like, you know, I need to intervene. I need to do something. I need to change the situation that I'm in. Maybe you can question God's wisdom. You could start to say, Lord, I've done everything in my power. Don't you know the difference between like, don't you see what this person is going through? Don't you see the medical condition that they're in? If I have compassion on them, don't you? Shouldn't you have compassion? Shouldn't you intervene? Shouldn't you do something about it? Or even somebody that's like literally dying and they leave behind children. And you're thinking to yourself, Lord, what is the deal with you? Like, surely if I recognize that there's something that this person is going to leave behind that's so great and the circumstances that these pers- people are going to be in with their lost parent is going to be difficult, if I feel this way? Sure, you feel this way? And you start to feel like maybe your wisdom is above his. Or maybe you can question God's love for you personally. If you're the person in that waiting period, you can say, Lord, do you not care about me? Do you not see how long I've been suffering and seeking you and praying and offering sacrifices and giving to the church and serving and doing everything? Lord, what's your deal? What's your deal? Am I the only one that has felt this before? Like, am I in a room of people that have never been frustrated with the waiting period? Or can all of us say that every single one of us have gone through a season where we maybe go through these difficult moments? But waiting on the Lord is actually one of the most difficult acts of obedience. And obedience is one of these things, actually, that we have a foreign concept with in our Western culture, right? In our culture, we think, what? Money buys everything, right? If I want to speed something up, you know, even in Egypt, in Egyptian culture, right? Like in Egypt, if you want something to happen, what do you do? You pass the guy a little, you know, a little, little 20 spot, you know? You make a little donation, you know? They call it a donation, right? It's, in Egypt, it's, it's a very common thing. But even in our society here in the West, we have that same mentality. How much can I flex on that person? How much can I really take care of that person? How much can I really do something to be able to get something to move along? In our society, we equate wealth to hurrying things up, right? So now, when we're people that are wealthy and can't slow things, can't hurry things up and things start to slow down, we really struggle with it that much more, right? Because if I can't change my circumstances with my own power, with my own wealth, with my own intellect, then I'm left to do what? Just be obedient. See, King David struggled with this too. You can see all through the Psalms, I waited patiently for the Lord. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? But he says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. 
I want to ask you guys a question. As you look through the whole narrative of Scripture, do you ever see that God's track record in Scripture is one of, like, speed? Like, look at through all of the totality of the Scriptures. There's circumstances, for sure, where he acted quick. But when you look at the long track record of Scripture, let's take a few stories. When you look at Abraham, Abraham, Abraham and his wife Sarah were praying to the Lord for a child. And the Lord finally said, you know what, I'm going to give you a child. How long did he wait? From when the Lord said to him, Sarah will be pregnant, to actually the moment that she gave birth. How long? Who can take a guess? Nine months? A year? Two years? Three years? Ten years? Twenty? Try 25. Very good. Try 25. Can you imagine how much Abraham must have been going crazy in that moment? Like, hence Hagar, hence Ishmael, right? Like, Lord, let me figure out what I can do to speed this process along, right? Like, you told me I was going to have a child. You told me that my seed was going to be the child of promise. You told me that my descendants would be like the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. Like, you promised me. You said all these different things. Then you got me waiting year one. Okay, cool. I'll wait for you, Lord. Year two. Okay, cool. I'll wait for you. Year 10. All right, Lord, something is off here. Like, maybe I misunderstood the message. Maybe I misinterpreted it. Maybe I need to ask one of the early church fathers how they would interpret that. I'm joking. There's no early church fathers at that time. Like, 25 years, 25 years to be waiting is insane. It's intense. And I wonder how much Abraham must have been going through. 25 years is a long time to wait. Let's go on Moses. Moses. The Lord tells him, you're going to free my people from Egypt. And all of a sudden, the Lord acts. He does his thing. He splits the sea. He does miracle in the ten plagues. He says miracle in sign and wonder. And he tells Moses that I'm going to take you to the land of promise. And you are going to be the person who is going to free these Israelites and bring them to the promised land. How long did he wait? Forty years. Forty years. I read a great quote that said, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning that he was nobody, and he spent his final 40 years discovering what God can do with that nobody. Right? There was this process that was happening in Moses that was molding him, that was refining him, that even in those 40 years when he was in Egypt with the people of Israel, God was doing something in him, molding him. So that brings us to the why. Why wait? Why wait? It's like, come on, Lord. Like, you, you can move this process along. You're the one that spoke the world into existence. I'm convinced that what God does in us while we wait is as important as what we are waiting for. Once again, what God does in us while we are waiting is as important as what we are waiting for. Was Abraham the same man after those 25 years of waiting? Was Moses? Was every single person that's waited in Scripture on the Lord different when King David was running away from Saul? Lord Samuel anoints him as a king. He anoints him as a king. He says, you will be the next, you are the king. And he's waiting and he's being hunted down and Saul is doing everything in his power to try to destroy him. Where are you, Lord? He waited patiently for the Lord. Where was David? Why did David become a man after God's own heart? Because in the waiting, God was doing something in him. I've been in a season of waiting in my life. And in those seasons, now, when I look back at them, I think, thank you, Lord, for the waiting. Thank you, Lord, for the waiting, because in the waiting, you were doing something to refine me, to mold me, and to make me more like you. You were, you were refining me into the person that you desired me to be. C.S. Lewis has a great quote. He says, I am sure that God keeps no one waiting unless he sees that it is good for him to wait. When you do get into your room, you will find that the long wait has done some kind of good which you would not have had otherwise. The waiting did something good in you that you would not have experienced otherwise outside of the waiting. And I think when all of us think about our circumstances, we want the glory without the struggle. We want the resurrection without the cross. 
We want all the good things that come with God, all the blessing of the Lord, without the things that mold us into who he desires us to be. Father Paul's been saying this over and over again, but even when you talk about the mystery of marriage, right? Marriage is not necessarily for happiness, it's for sanctification. It's for God to change you into the person that he desires you to be. So anything that's great, does it come fast? Like, give me one thing. It doesn't come fast. Nothing that's great comes fast. Everything that is great requires work, it requires patience, it comes, requires perseverance, and it's in that process that God molds us into who he wants us to be. So what's happening in us? Look what St. Paul says. But not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that what? Tribulation produces what? Perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. God is producing qualities in us while we wait. What that means is that biblically, waiting isn't just something that we have to do until we get what we want. Waiting isn't something that we have to do in order to get what we want. Waiting is part of the process of God molding us into who we want to want who he wants us to be. In the waiting period, waiting exposes our idols and throws a wrench into our coping mechanisms. It brings us to the end of what we can control and forces us to cry to God. God doesn't waste our waiting. He uses it to conform us to the image of his son. So what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to be doing in the waiting? First thing is waiting isn't passive. Waiting isn't me, I'm on this platform, and I'm just hanging out waiting for the train to arrive. Like, that's not what waiting is. Waiting isn't me being doing nothing about the process. Actually, biblical waiting is not passive at all. People sometimes say, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm just waiting for God to do his thing. I'm waiting, you know, Abuna, I'm going through some financial troubles, and I'm just waiting on the Lord for the Lord to give me more money. Okay, what are you doing in the meantime? Like, what are you doing about the fifty, sixty thousand dollars in credit card debt that you have right now? Have you learned tighten the belt? Have you learned no 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 Abuna? Abuna, I'm just praying. And I'm asking God, like I'm asking God for me to land on, you know, the monopoly you've just collected two hundred dollars. Like that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the Lord to intervene and do something about it. You have impulsive spending. You have a refusal to save money. You've gotten into a huge money mess. Can't wait on the Lord for that. You have to do something to change your circumstances. Maybe I'm selfish. Maybe I'm, I find myself being very narcissistic and self-focused on everything in my life. And every time there's a problem with someone, what do I do? I blame it on the other person. I'm going to be real with you. If every time there's a conflict, it's somebody else's fault... I'm fairly confident it's your fault. I'm fairly confident it's your fault because if you cannot acknowledge that there's something in someone else that maybe is positive or maybe wasn't part of your hurt or your wound and you maybe contributed to that, then I'm, com I'm convinced that that's your fault. So waiting isn't a passive thing. It's not that I'm just hanging around doing nothing. There's an active role that I have. I should be serving, I should be giving, I should do everything in my power, offering myself up to the Lord during those periods of waiting. I shouldn't be just hanging around doing nothing. I love this definition. It says, waiting on the Lord is a confident, disciplined, expectant, active, sometimes painful clinging to God. I will trust you and I will obey you even though the circumstances of my life are not turning out the way that I want them to. Confident, disciplined, expectant, active. Look at those positive language. It's not negative language. And they may not turn out the way that I want them to, but I'm betting everything on you, God. And there's no plan B. You are plan A, you are plan B, you are plan C, you're every plan. And the waiting on the Lord is truly the hardest work of hope. It's the hardest work of hope. Right? When you have, have any, how many of you have ever read the book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning? Anyone ever read that book? It's a fantastic book about Holocaust survivors and what, how they survived the Holocaust. What they did in order for them to be able 
to survive. And what Viktor Frankl reduces, like if I were to summarize the whole book, is he said they kept hope. That the hope that they would have is that the next day their uh, guard would be a little kinder, that the food would be a little bit softer, and they would give thanks and have gratitude for just the little things. And that's what gave them the hope to be able to get through the day of suffering that they were in. Hope is the hardest work that we can do. But I don't hope in a random person. I don't hope in this obscure force. I don't hope in somebody that I don't have a relationship with. I hope in someone who has walked with me through the valley of the shadow of death. I hope in someone who's carried me upon their shoulders. I hope in somebody who's been with me through the highs and the lows. I don't hope in anyone who's far and distant. I hope in somebody who I've encountered and I've trusted and I've felt his presence through it all. So there are a few things that I want to share with you about what waiting requires of us. Waiting on the Lord requires patient trust. Patient trust. Hardest thing in the world. Have any of you guys ever, do you guys know what this is? Trapeze. How many of you guys ever watched trapeze? You know trapeze athletes? And in trapeze, there's actually two people that are, are, are one is called the flyer and one is called the catcher. If ever, if, actually in D.C., the Washington Trapeze Center is amazing. You watch people literally throw themselves and then somebody will catch them. And it's quite the amazing thing. And in this book by Henry Nouwen, he writes about his relationship with these two trapeze athletes. And in this book, he talks about how the flyer and the catcher, their relationship has to be like super close. And it's in that closeness that they trust that when the flyer flings themselves off this trapeze, that the catcher is going to do what? Catch him. They can't move, they can't flail, they can't extend themselves to the catcher. They have to just stay as still as they possibly can from the period of flying to the moment the catcher catches them. In his book, he says this quote, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but he must wait. He must wait. It's a beautiful analogy. It's a beautiful analogy to our relationship with God. We want to fly. We want to take leaps. We want to do things in our relationship with God. We want to be able to get through the circumstance that we're going through. And we are flying, Lord, and we're waiting. Lord, catch, catch. And a lot of us are going left and right. A lot of us are flailing. A lot of us are doing everything in our power. And what happens? If I flail and I move, as the flyer, the catcher can't catch me. The catcher can't reach. I'm not allowed to reach as the flyer. My sole responsibility is to just stay still. Now that's, in my opinion, one of the most difficult things in the, in the world. But that's why it requires confident humility. What is confident humility? Seems like a, a juxtaposition, right? Like, Confidence and humility, how can that be? Because waiting by nature is something that only humble people can do. Or at least what the humble can do with grace. To wait for something is to recognize that I'm not in control. I'm not calling the shots. The timing is not up to me. In our society, again, like I said earlier, there's a correlation between status and waiting. You go to a restaurant, and you're waiting at that restaurant, again, you throw a little 20 spot or 100 spot, they're going to make sure that they expedite you to the front of the line. Because when you have a little bit of wealth, you can do something. But waiting reminds me that I'm not in charge. I am the creation, and you are the creator. And God is doing something in us. Therefore, we can trust his wisdom and his timing. And we can wait with what? With confidence. Therefore, the single most important thing that one does when they are waiting is what? What do you guys think? In the waiting. What's the single most important thing that you could do while you are waiting? Hmm? 
throw out hope, okay, hope, yeah, but give me some other words. Huh? Faith, Faith okay, okay. Meditate, okay. Praying. Praying. Now, I'm not saying that as like the two Sunday school things that you learned your whole entire life, like you must read your Bible and pray. I'm saying prayer as a relationship. I'm saying prayer that I'm clinging to you, Lord, and I will not leave you until you bless me. I'm clinging on to you, Lord, and I trust you. You know, we can be confident because, again, God is leaving us, leading us. We express humility because we are confident that his way is the best. Right? Like, my kids at three years old, it's the best age in the world to learn about confidence, humility. It's the best age in the world because they defer to their mama and dada. They defer. They trust. They have confidence that whatever their mom and their dad will take them is the best place. And as they get a little bit older, they start to believe, no, no, I got this, mom and dad. Like, I got this. Although Cece tests me a little bit, but... Both of them, Micah too. But there is this confident humility that these kids know that their dad and their mom has the best thing in store for them. They're not worried. They wake up every morning like, what kind of cool thing are we going to do today, mommy and daddy? Like, what's in for the... And they trust that the day is going to be awesome because their parents are leading them into their own promised land. And I think all of us, when we're in that moment where we're stressed out, where we're losing confidence in God, what do we do? We get a little frantic. Let's be real. Let's be real. Abuna, I'm like 29 and a half. Where is the knight in shining armor? Like, I've been praying. I've been doing, I'm 29 and a half, Abuna. Like, Abuna, this has to happen before I hit 30. If it doesn't hit 30, like, what am I going to do, Abuna? And I'm not making fun of it. I'm honestly not. I'm actually just saying like this like intensity that the person starts to feel as our culture puts pressure on them to get married. Abuna, like by now I look around and everyone around me has like a house, has a car. Like, oh my gosh, Abuna, like what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I've been praying, I've been asking God to do this. And you see the franticness that happens in a person when they are not getting what they want, when they're in that period of waiting. Who's the author of that franticness? Is it God? If I'm clinging to my father and I love him and I know that he's with me in the highs and the lows, am I supposed to be frantic? God's voice is never frantic. It's never frantic. Sometimes I find myself waiting up in the middle of the night and I'm thinking, you should have done this. 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 There's some, this person that needs you. And sometimes I have to just say to myself, Lord, I just need you to help me be still. Because the voices and the craziness and the intensity, your voice is the voice of the good shepherd. You're the voice. Your voice is the one that leads me to green pastures. You're the, your voice is the voice that restores my soul. Your voice is the voice that tells me what? Peace be still. When you think about the disciples in Mark chapter 4, when they are rowing and rowing and rowing, and there is a storm, and they're like, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? What are you doing, Lord? Come, intervene, do something. He's hanging out sleeping. And he says to them, oh, you have little faith. <laughs> like, what? He stands before the storm, and he says, peace be still. And the storm sees And all the craziness that they were just doing hours prior disappears in the light of his voice. Disappears in a second. God's voice is never frantic. The devil's voice is frantic. The devil's voice divides. My own thoughts can be frantic because I have not clung and trusted in the good shepherd. Back to Victor Victor Frankl. Waiting on the Lord requires what? Inextinguishable hope. Who knows what inextinguishable hope is? What is faith? 
Faith is the evidence of what? Things hoped for. Things unseen. Right? Like we have our faith in something that we hope for, the hope of eternity, the hope of the place where there is no sorrow, the place where no eye has seen nor, ent- nor has heard nor entered the heart of man, the things which you, O God, have prepared for those who love you. Faith is what gives us hope. And hope is not something that we see, not something that we can necessarily be tangible and grasp. But we cry for hope. We cry for hope. We hunger and thirst for that experience. In the Bible, we find that the most wonderful promise attached to waiting on the Lord is this one. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Now, as I was meditating on this, I read a commentary that I thought was really beautiful about this. It says, any of you guys have ever uh, studied how birds fly? So birds, it's weird, you know, if you're interested in birds. Birds can fly in three different ways. They have something called flapping, you know, and they say a bird can flap 70 times in, I think, a minute or a second. I think it's 70 times a second, a minute, sorry, pardon me. So they can flap like a whole bunch, and they could get some air time in flapping, right? But once that bird flaps, right, they can then start to go into the next phase, which is gliding. And gliding is like where you start to get like a little bit more airtime, you get a little bit better. And gliding is like cool. But then once the goal of like this bird, like an eagle, eagle's very co- known for this, is once they get to that period of gliding, you can glide for a while, but eventually you're going to land if you don't keep on flying, right? What an eagle does is it goes even higher and it catches the wind underneath it. And then what does it do? It soars. I think a lot of us are flapping. Look to the person next to you. You flapped at least one point in your life. It's not just me. All of us have flapped. We flap. Lord, where are you? Lord, I'm on. It's that flailing, you know? We've all flapped. And there are three different types of people in this. There are people that are soaring right now in their relationship with God. And it's really annoying to be with somebody that's soaring. I'll be honest with you. When you are like in your period where you are suffering and you're waiting on the Lord and you see this person like leaping and like God is doing miracles and signs and wonders, you're like, what about me? Hello, Lord. Hello. Like, why why am I invisible to you and this person is soaring? We have a lot of soars in this church by the grace of God. Thank God for all the soars in our church because y'all carry us, you encourage us, you support us, you inspire us. And then you have some people that are running. They're running. And they're moving, and they're motivated, and they're still waiting, and they're running, and they're not growing weary. They're not growing weary. And you have some people that are walking. Lord, I'm walking. I want to get to the soaring. Like, okay, fine, take me to at least running. But those who are walking, you may feel you got nothing more than just a walk. Lord, I got nothing more to give. Like, I want to get to the soaring, but I'm in a period right now where I'm just walking. I can't keep seem to do anything more than walk. I can't seem to make any more progress than just that. Every time I feel like I'm getting to the next place, I get, def- I get deflated. And Lord, I just want to walk and not faint. I just want to walk and not faint. And I will venture to say, that I think God honors the walking more than the soaring. You know why? Because when you're soaring, you're carried by him. When you're walking, you're struggling. You can't get your right foot next to your left foot, but you're still doing it. You're still pushing yourself. You're still motivated. You're still trusting in God's goodness. You're still hoping, and you're still believing that he is who he says he is. For any of you guys who may feel like you're in a season of walking, keep on going. Keep on going. The Lord will honor your walking. And you'll see as you're walking, eventually, you'll build that endurance by waiting on him that you'll start running. 
And eventually, as you've been running for a while, you'll start to look back at all those circumstances and you'll trust in God's faithfulness and you'll start to soar. You know, there's a legend about how an eagle will fly. You ever hear about this? That a legend, the legend says that the only way that an eagle can renew its strength is by doing what? After a period of time, the beak on the eagle begins to grow. And the, bre- the beak grows so like, intensely that it weighs down the eagle. So the only way that the eagle can actually renew its strength is by actually landing and breaking its beak, shaving that part of its nose off in order for it to be. Some of us, we, we don't like the waiting because we don't like the refining. But you can't soar without the shaving off of certain things that are hindering me from knowing God. If you're walking today, keep on walking. If you're running, keep on running. If you're soaring, pray for me. If you're crawling, somebody said, what if you're crawling? Isaiah doesn't address the crawling. (laughs) But King David does. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, and praise to our God. Many will see it and fear, and I will trust in the Lord. That's why the Psalms are the best. I waited patiently for the Lord. Y'all, y'all ever heard of U2? U2? U2 has a song that they sing about this. You know, and when you see it, if you've ever been to a U2 concert, you'll see that when this song goes on, it's like a, like a church. Everybody's like raising their hands and worshiping, and, and they don't even know what they're saying. They're not recognizing that they're quoting Psalm 40. U2 does, but the rest of the people in the, in the concert have no idea. But they're saying, I waited patiently for the Lord. All of us today... Wait patiently for the Lord, because in waiting patiently for him, he will bring you out of the horrible pit that you're in. He'll bring you out of the miry clay. He'll set your feet upon a rock. That no matter what you are going through, you will look back at your life and you will sing a new song, a song of praise, because many will see the work that God has done in you in the waiting and fear and will trust in the Lord. Because I promise you, the one we are waiting for will be worth the wait. The one all of us are waiting for will be worth the wait. So what I want to encourage you guys today is as we open up this series, to think about your relationship with God today. Think if you're in a period of waiting, which I'm sure most of us are in, what am I doing? How am I responding to that waiting? Am I confidently trusting him? Am I being humble? Am I having expectant hope? Or am I doing everything in my power to try to change my circumstances and run away from the waiting? I pray that every single one of us would be inspired by this series as we continue it over the next three weeks, that we'd be motivated to wait on the Lord and to trust in his goodness and to believe that this period of waiting is what? This period of waiting is doing something in us far greater than we could ever imagine. Because... What God does in us while we are waiting is more important than what what it is that we are waiting for. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand for a prayer.